So, final session. We are here, and then we have a 55-minute session and seven-hour session, so we're starting out five minutes short. Uh, so let's get right after it. Uh, Dr. Zo George, George Zodro, my co-host for the conference, will start the session. Uh, so, George, he's from Rice University, obviously. So, thanks very much. Uh, Unlike my friends uh, Henry Aaron and uh, James Alm, I am somewhat more accustomed to uh, <laughs> concluding uh, conferences and other, other lists. Uh, so I, I have no sympathy for you, Jim, that you had to come be the second discussant. Uh, perhaps a little more from my wife, uh, the, the former Dory Albert, but uh, <laughs> that's another story. Um, this is a paper that looks, uh, uh, does a simulation analysis, the dynamic effects of a U.S. corporate income tax uh, rate cut. Uh, we have uh, four, uh, four authors, and all four authors are here. I think the author-audience ratio is pretty high, uh, but uh, it's John and myself uh, and uh, Bob and Tom. Um, and, and basically, we're, we're starting with uh, where, where Roseanne was uh, uh, discussing the fact that uh, a lot of people are concerned about the fact that uh, corporate tax rates in the U.S., uh, certainly relative to what they, where they were after the, uh, the Tax Reform Act of 86, um, are, are relatively high. There's been a, a, a swing uh, for the statutory rate. Uh, used to be about eight points below, now three points above. Uh, then the effective marginal tax rate, the swing is not as great, uh, but still about a five-point uh, swing there. Uh, and there's the, the traditional concerns about the effects of that uh, on sort of standard macro, uh, macro variables, uh, as well as the concern that uh, high statutory rates <laughs> Uh, tend to encourage and facilitate uh, various forms of tax arbitrage, especially uh, income shifting. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of approaches to uh, tax reform that have been suggested uh, as a result of this. Um, might be uh, some broad-based, I mean, some fundamental reforms in the form of uh, uh, consumption taxes. You might uh, do a, go to a value-added tax. I don't think any Texas governors have yet said that would be treason, but it's probably only a matter of time. But there are others as well. Uh, but we're not going to talk about those at all today. Basically, just uh, uh, a standard sort of uh, TRA 86 type of uh, brace, base broadening rate reducing reform. Uh, or in some other cases, uh, just lower the rate and offset the revenues uh, with uh, something else. Um, so the, where we'll start is, is looking at a uh, reduction in the statutory rate financed with elimination of a wide range of uh, business tax expenditures. Uh, and then at the end, we'll talk about instead uh, doing some wage taxes or uh, some spending cuts. Uh, we'll assume dynamic revenue neutrality throughout. Uh, and we're using a, a model that uh, John and I constructed uh, back when, when John was a graduate student. We started uh, with that back here at, uh, uh, at Rice. It's an overlapping generations. Uh, GE model. Um, so there's certainly a long tradition favoring these sorts of base broadening, rate reducing reforms. Uh, the arguments are the standard ones, uh, promote growth, economic efficiency, uh, and resource allocation, although you have to be careful. Uh, the the uh, reforms may or may not address uh, different types. There's lots of other, lots of distortions in the system. Uh, so even, say, a TRA 86 type of uh, reform of the corporate tax uh, might not necessarily uh, address non-corporate corporate distortions, debt versus equity, uh, something which was the focus of the Merleys Review in the UK recently, uh, housing versus non-housing investment, and uh, consumption versus savings dis uh, distortions as well. Uh, and, and we think that our model is, uh, is reasonably good at, at capturing uh, most of those, not all of them, but most of those uh, distortions. Uh, and then the standard arguments uh, uh, as well are to, that uh, uh, a system with fewer preferences should be a simpler system uh, to administer and certainly reduce uh, incentives uh, for tax avoidance uh, planning and, and, and evasion and create at least the perception and in some cases the, the reality of a, a fairer tax system. Uh, and as many people have pointed out, international considerations make uh, reform uh, all the more uh, interesting to think about. Uh, the most important factors, uh, I think, to consider are the increase in international capital mobility, the rise of cross-border investment, uh, a lot of evidence in recent years, many of it uh, due to Roseanne and her co-authors, on the increasing sensitivity investment to uh, tax differentials, uh, and uh, certainly a lot of evidence on uh, increasing importance of uh, uh, income shifting and relatively aggressive international uh, tax planning. Uh, there are alternative approaches which people have talked about already, uh, and, and, and that's the, the idea of let's keep the, keep the rate high but to, uh, create the incentives with uh, uh, 
uh, create the incentives for investment with various types of direct investment incentives. Uh, the argument being, of course, that such incentives apply uh, only to new investment uh, and there's no rate reduction for old capital. Uh, so you get the effect of reducing the marginal effective tax rate for normal returns uh, on new investment, but you tax it above normal returns uh, to both existing uh, and new investment at the relatively high statutory rate, which you've, which, uh, you've kept up. Uh, and it also uh, avoids creating a differential between corporate and personal rates to try to limit any uh, possible possibilities of income shifting uh, uh, there. Uh, but there are a lot of counterarguments to that as well. Uh, in particular, there's been a lot of focus in recent years due to the work of Mike Devereaux and many others uh, on uh, investments uh, that are generated by uh, mo mobile multinationals, but those that generate firm-specific rents and are highly mobile. Uh, and Mike argues that uh, such inv investments are going to tend to respond uh, primarily to uh, uh, average tax rates, which are determined largely by uh, statutory rates. Uh, and they've got some empirical evidence which suggests that, uh, that, uh, that it's, there's a lot of responsiveness here and a lot of responsiveness to increasing over time. Uh, Alan Arbeck has uh, a couple of papers in which he argues that the dispersion of profits is increasing, suggesting that more and more firms, that, that a lot of the profits are being generated by uh, firms with above normal uh, rents, uh, but the rate reduction is still going to lose, uh, lose revenue on uh, existing and location-specific uh, rents. Uh, how important the, the labor, uh, in labor uh, market uh, income shifting argument is, it depends on the, the, the context, especially if it doesn't matter too much if you lower the lower rate, if most of the income is being shifted to, and you've got a progressive system as we do in the current system. Uh, and uh, the net impact also depends on whether the uh, income is exempt or just being deferred. Um, Certainly, the low statutory rate will have the benefit of reducing incentives for shifting, as I've said. And there have been several recent theoretical models that have sort of laid out the case uh, for uh, base broadening rate reducing reforms in uh, a much more formal way. I mean, this has been an argument that's been around for, for many, many years, uh, but uh, it's never been really cast in an efficiency uh, context, uh, often anyway. Uh, but uh, several of these models have looked at uh, situations where firms have uh, capacity to uh, either uh, use transfer pricing or loan reallocation uh, to, to shift income, or you might have uh, models with different, uh, different capital mobility and different uh, relative rates of profitability. Uh, and, and all these models tend to point uh, in the direction of a, uh, a base broadening rate lowering reform uh, with, within a pure efficiency context rather than just the traditional Haig-Simons uh, approach. Um, what we do in our model, uh, if, if we start with the sort of the, the, the first model, the first model is a, uh, sort of a rational expectations, perfect foresight uh, sort of model. Uh, and, and it starts out as a, a, a closed economy, an overlapping generation structure. So we have 55 different generations or alive at, at any point in time. We try to keep track of the assets that each of these generations have so that when, uh, when things change, uh, then we can, we can track the effects uh, by generation. We can also try to include in the analysis uh, uh, a more complete description of what the current system is. Uh, so if, if we've got uh, a lot of consumption tax features, for example, in the, in, the, in the system already, even though it's an income tax, we can try to capture those. Uh, the, the base model has four sectors, corporate, non-corporate, uh, owner-occupied housing, uh, and rental housing. Uh, and as I mentioned, we, we initially designed it to focus on uh, transitional issues. We can uh, have, we have, a, have firms that optimize their investment path over time, and so we can track the economy period by period. And also, uh, to look at the transitional effects of reform, we can calculate the asset values. At the time of the enactment of reform, we can look at the windfall gains and losses uh, and uh, uh, track those uh, over time uh, as well. Uh, but we didn't really focus so much on, on, on those things for this analysis. Uh, and what we tried to do was uh, expand it in, in uh, four different directions to try to uh, analyze those a little bit more completely, at least. It's still a, a very highly stylized model, no question about that. Uh, but uh, we tried to extend it in several different ways to make it uh, a little more realistic for purposes. Whoa. <laughs> well, I, I really can't complain too much about that because uh, about, oh, Three months ago, I called my daughter, and she picks up the phone and says, Dad, Dad, I can't talk long. I'm in class. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what can I say? Uh, what we want to do first uh, is, <laughs> is model-based broadening. And so what we did there 
uh, was try to uh, basically just take the JCT list uh, and, and specify how the uh, provisions, the various provisions, enter the firm value function in our uh, in our model. So we look at uh, rate reducing reforms, we uh, production incentives, investment incentives, a few lump sum deductions. So we're we're categorizing the various expenditures uh, in, in, in those ways. But uh, I mean, we're not doing anything uh, very fancy here. I mean, basically, we're we're taking almost all the expenditures that JCT has. We we uh, recognize that a lot of these are, 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 are contentious and are things that may or may not uh, should be uh, should or should not be eliminated from the system. Uh, one that's been mentioned, and we have two of the, the proponents here, uh, but both views, uh, LIFO inventory, uh, uh, Ed and others in the paper have argued that basically uh, it is a tax. We ought to get rid of the thing. Uh, it is not a very good uh, inflation adjustment mechanism and, and basically uh, allows quasi-permanent deferral of uh, the increased value of inventories uh, and other on the other hand, uh, Alan uh, has, has argued that uh, it may not be perfect, but it's not a bad ad hoc uh, uh, adjustment for inflation. And, and at the same time, the, the tax, there's lots of unrealized capital gains that don't get uh, uh, realized in the tax system. So we, we really don't get into those debates to, to any great extent. I mean, we're basically trying to get the, the amount of the expenditures that we're using uh, as large as possible within the context of the model that we have. Uh, so... Uh, uh, we uh, just uh, uh, take that. There, there also, there, there's no attempt uh, to, to sort of, you know, fine-tune the estimates uh, that JCT makes. Uh, we don't capture the interactions uh, between the, the uh, various estimates, and, and we don't consider any, any benefits of the tax expenditures, effects on productivity, for example, of the research credit, or advantages of, of income measurement like the, the, the LIFO point. And we certainly don't worry about uh, political feasibility. We just sort of throw them all in. Uh, the, the one thing we don't throw in is we, we really don't the, – the, the international sector of the model is, is obviously very simple, and so uh, we really can't uh, consider uh, deferral or per-country foreign tax credit limits, things like that, uh, within the, the context of, of this model, uh, although we are working uh, on extending it to, to include those features. Um, we also had an imperfectly competitive sector that generates uh, these economic rents. It's uh, just a sector within the U.S. economy that permanently earns above normal profits. Uh, we basically split the corporate sector up into uh, two components, one uh, which earns rents, which contains uh, the largest multinationals uh, and everything else. Uh, and the, the group of the multinationals is assumed to earn approximately half their income abroad. Uh, and so that creates a, a, a reservoir of, for uh, uh, income shifting or undoing the income shifting uh, when we change the uh, corporate tax rate. Um, the open economy approach is uh, uh, fairly ad hoc. We just uh, assume a pretty simple uh, constant elasticity of supply relationship where the foreign capital inflows are determined by relative uh, rates of return after corporate income taxes uh, and just use a, a unitary elasticity there trying to capture the notion that the U.S. is not uh, really closed uh, uh, or open. And then the final extension is uh, we add a, uh, again, a fairly ad hoc sort of way, uh, uh, an income shifting component to the notion that, that uh, if rates drop, uh, there, there might be a uh, inflow of uh, funds from uh, income that was formerly shifted to lower tax uh, countries. And we follow Bartelsman and Beetsma uh, in an uh, empirical piece that estimates or that argues that this share is, is, is quite large. And, and, and we just uh, we assume that it's 50 percent. That's actually less than what they estimate. Uh, but it doesn't, uh, for example, as, as Jane said, uh, take into any uh, account the idea that look, rates might uh, decline abroad in response to a, a U.S. tax change, sort of depending on whether uh, people think that uh, we're, we're catching up or we're trying to be more aggressive in terms of uh, 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 lowering our rates. So uh, just to sort of walk you through the, the, the simulation results, uh, the benchmark case that we have uh, is just a straight uh, base broadening rate lowering reform. Uh, we get rid of the, all the tax expenditures uh, that we have uh, in, in the system, uh, and uh, we use all the revenues to, to uh, lower uh, the corporate rate, and, and, and we cheat a little bit uh, because we use the, even the revenues from the uh, non-corporate side, we throw back in to the, uh, uh, the corporate revenues. So it gives us a rel uh, really a, a very large uh, rate decline uh, from almost 35, 35 excuse me, 35% to, to 20 uh, but even when we do all that, uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, 
and the GDP declines uh, after five years just by a little bit, uh, and in the long run uh, by uh, half a percent. So uh, in, in keeping with uh, the negative, negative messages that we get, uh, the, uh, uh, have had in this conference, uh, this particular reform anyway does not generate uh, uh, even any GDP gains. Uh, and it, it just seems to reflect the classic problem with these base broadening rate lowering reforms, which is uh, that in this case what's happening uh, is that uh, you're reducing the statutory rate, but at the same time you're getting rid of a, a lot of tax expenditures, which affect uh, marginal effective tax rates and the cost of capital uh, simultaneously. And at the same time, you're lowering the tax rate on all this old capital. Uh, and that causes uh, uh, windfall losses. And so the net effect is a, uh, an increase in the cost of capital. We end up with investment decreases of around uh, 3% in the simulations, and uh, consumption increases uh, 10. Uh, I hope that's a real-time evaluation. Uh, what uh, that means, basically, is, is, is that uh, consumption increases initially but declines uh, just a little bit uh, in the long run, and, and labor supply is uh, virtually unchanged. Um, so what about these extensions? Uh, well, the first thing we throw in is the imperfectly competitive sector, uh, but that turns out actually to worsen the, the macroeconomic effects a little bit. Uh, the corporate rate, uh, corporate rate reduction, even though it does attract uh, uh, more capital to the, to the uh, imperfectly uh, competitive sector, uh, it also means that we're taxing the existing capital there at lower rates. Uh, and uh, this uh, limits the rate reduction uh, that occurs, but we end up with an even uh, slightly uh, larger GDP uh, reduction uh, of 0.84% uh, uh, in the long run rather than the 0.56 that we got uh, initially. Uh, and a, a slightly larger reductions uh, in investment uh, as well. Uh, when we add the capital mobility, in principle, that uh, could increase investment. Uh, but the problem is that uh, for the reasons we just described, sort of these offsetting effects of the, the rate cut uh, and the base broadening measures uh, on the cost of capital, uh, the change in after-tax interest rates in the model is very small. And so uh, it doesn't really matter what the elasticity of capital supply is. It's just the, the, rate, the rate differential is so small we don't get much uh, uh, capital inflows. It doesn't really have much an effect at all. Uh, and when we throw in the, uh, the income shifting, it certainly makes things uh, a, a little better, uh, but uh, not a huge uh, difference here either. Uh, we end up with a, a slightly larger rate cut, uh, sl slightly uh, smaller reduction uh, in investment, uh, uh, 3% uh, in the long run rather than 35 uh, and a, a, a somewhat smaller reduction uh, in GDP as well, uh, uh, 02 instead of 0.3 and 0.63 rather than 0.84 uh, in the long run. But if we add up all three, if we add up all three of the extensions, uh, then the bottom line is that, uh, that they don't make a whole lot of uh, difference. And at least for these particular uh, set of simulation results, uh, we end up with, with uh, slightly larger declines uh, than we would otherwise. Um, now, uh, Bob mentioned the Treasury report uh, that uh, comes up with a, a different conclusion. They have uh, basically a, a very similar approach, uh, also a closed economy model. They don't have the income shifting, uh, and, and they end up with uh, smaller, uh, smaller uh, results, but positive results uh, in general for the, uh, a very basically similar reform. Uh, but the problem there uh, is that they assume that uh, only accelerated depreciation has uh, in incentive effects on, on investment, and all the other uh, uh, tax expenditures don't. Now, you can argue that they might be inefficient tax expenditures, but, but it's hard uh, for us to imagine that they will have no effect on investment, even in the uh, affected industries. Uh, but uh, when we adopt this assumption, just to sort of check things, uh, check things out, run the same, same approach, uh, but assume that everything but accelerated depreciation is lump sum, uh, then we get results that are sort of broadly similar to what Treasury got, about a half a percent increase uh, in GDP uh, in the long run, about an uh, equal size uh, increase uh, in consumption. Um, but because we didn't really find that uh, uh, approach compelling, we, we tried several different, uh, different approaches. Um, one is to stack reforms uh, a little differently. So instead of getting rid of all the tax expenditures, uh, what, we, what we tried to do was say, let's, let's uh, sort of uh, put a floor under the corporate tax rate, uh, drop it at 25% in the model, 
uh, and then order the elimination of the tax expenditure so that the investment incentives, which tend to have the biggest effects uh, relative to the production incentives or the, to the, in any general incentive, is going to have less of an effect on investment than the uh, specifically targeted uh, uh, incentive. Uh, so when we did that, uh, we uh, were able to keep accelerated depreciation and most of the other in, in investment incentives. Uh, and uh, we get somewhat more favorable results uh, with this particular, uh, particular design. Uh, we get a, uh, a long run increase of investment, about a half percent uh, in the long run, and about a 0.6, 0.3% after 10, and 0.6 uh, in the long run for uh, GDP, uh, and uh, about a 0.8% long run increase in consumption. It takes a while to get there. Uh, but uh, when, when you do, there's a, an increase in the long run with uh, not much of a, a change in, uh, uh, in labor supply. And, and then the last couple of experiments, uh, we could do a, 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 base, uh, I mean a, a rate cut reform uh, and not broaden the base in the corporate sector, sort of leave everything there. And as, as Jane mentioned in, the, mentions in the paper, there's all sorts of reform, pro, reform proposals out there, uh, some of them which include, uh, in, include uh, things like leaving all the preferences in but cutting the rates anyway. Uh, and so if we do that with uh, a, a wage tax, then we, uh, that is, we cut the rate to 25% and finance everything uh, with the wage tax. Uh, then we're basically, it's a sort of a you know, quasi-consumption tax reform. Uh, and so we get a, a 2 to 2.5% two increase in investment uh, and uh, almost a 1% uh, increase in GDP uh, in the long run and about 0.7% increase uh, in consumption, although, again, the, the transition is, is, is pretty lengthy, uh, and a small decline in labor supply because of the, the wage tax uh, increase. And then the final simulation, uh, suppose we just do it with, with cuts in spending. Uh, and basically what we do is just do it with a, a reduction in, in government transfers in the model. This is a, this is a pure lump sum uh, uh, experiment. Uh, and uh, so uh, what we're uh, sort of isolating the efficiency gains, uh, but obviously going to have distributional consequences. It will depend on the exact nature of the cuts uh, in, the, in, in the government transfers. And in this case, we only have just a single representative individual, so we don't address those uh, uh, at all. And the long run effects uh, uh, here, or the effects here, uh, are an increase of investment about 3% uh, and GDP of uh, a little bit under one uh, after 10 years and about 1.3 uh, in the long run. And sort of uh, same increase uh, or similar increase in consumption uh, in the long run and a very slight increase uh, in, in, in labor supply. So uh, the bottom line of all these simulations uh, basically, oh, oh, it's plenty, uh, got um, Suggest that if, if we just do the straight base broadening rate reducing reform, uh, then uh, the net effect, uh, at least in terms of these uh, economic aggregates, is going to be uh, it will be negative. So we've got investment declines uh, of about three percent and a GDP declines of about a, a, a half a percent. Um, and, and basically the problem is it's very hard to overcome uh, the, the, the losses that occur from the lower tax rate on, uh, on, on old capital. And the net effects of the three model extensions uh, really didn't, uh, at least the way that we did them, didn't uh, uh, change these effects very much and, if anything, made them uh, a little bit worse. Uh, and in order to get more favorable macro results, uh, you basically have to, to, to design the, the corporate rate cut a little more carefully. Uh, so you can design it in terms of which tax expenditures uh, you get rid of, which uh, certainly seems uh, plausible. So if we focus on uh, leaving, leaving the investment targeted in incentives in place and eliminating the others, then we end up uh, with uh, more positive effects. And, and similarly, uh, we would have uh, more positive macro effects uh, and effects on long-run consumption, at least, uh, if we substituted wage cuts or uh, uh, cuts in transfers, uh, but very different distributional and political implications associated with those reforms. Uh, no, question, no question about that. Uh, and then just to close, uh, things that we're looking at uh, in, in terms of extensions, we, we are uh, working on sort of different modeling of international capital flows. So when, right now we're just uh, international capital flows responding to after-tax rates, but uh, we, have two sources, we could have two sources of capital, one of them especially uh, responding to uh, after-tax rates in the imperfectly, imperfectly competitive sector. Uh, we certainly need a much more complex uh, international sector uh, to, so we can look at things like uh, ending deferral uh, and treatment of U.S. multinationals. There's a lot of different models of imperfect, imperfect competition out there uh, 
uh, as well. Uh, so that's one uh, possibility. Uh, and there's a lot of, and, and all of those things are things that we could do relatively easily. Easily, some of the more complicated things, uh, we, we basically are missing uh, a lot of the intersectoral gains that would occur with this kind of a reform. We have four sectors, and so uh, we're, we're, we're capturing that, uh, but uh, we're really not capturing any of the intersectoral within the corporate, and that's one of the underlying rationales, of course, for a, a, a base broadening rate lowering reform. Uh, so we don't get that. Um, <coughs> We, we may be overstating the gains because we're missing any, any external benefits associated with the, the uh, uh, tax expenditures, uh, but uh, we may also be, I mean, there's a lot of things that we might be missing uh, because of the structure of the model. Uh, the R&D tax credit might generate more, uh, more output, environmental provisions. Uh, things like low-income housing credit uh, may generate equity gains that uh, uh, we, we're not capturing as well. Uh, and, and then finally, we haven't really looked very, uh, uh, in any detail at the distributional effects, especially within uh, generations. So there's, there's plenty of things that uh, are left on the agenda. Thanks. Thank you, George. Our first discussant will be Rude A. Des Moines from Dr. Rude A. Des Moines from the International Monetary Fund. Well, thank you very much, uh, John and George, for uh, the invitation. Um, I've heard a lot of pessimism uh, the last day about U.S. policy, um, but coming from Greece, uh, actually things can be much worse, I can say. Um, now, this paper is not a contribution to filling the gap uh, in the U.S. Uh, for the budget. It is more about revenue-neutral reforms, right? It's it raises the question, is a cut in the U.S. corporate tax rate what the U.S. actually needs? And the answer is actually twofold. There's two pieces in the paper. Uh, the first part discusses more or less the literature and, and the, the various arguments and says, yes, uh, a policy of base broadening rate reduction is really what the U.S. needs. But then, as we've seen, the model does not really back this conclusion. So the second part of the paper says, well, maybe yes, uh, but there's a big but uh, included in that. Uh, my comments are a bit from an outside perspective, because I'm uh, not so familiar as most of you with the U.S. tax system. I approach it more from, uh, let's say, European uh, perspective, uh, perspective uh, also with experience with the similar types of models, but then apply to Europe, and also from an international perspective. Um, well, it's a black box. Um, so, let me first say a few words on the, the diamond soda of model. Um, I very much like the approach that was taken here. Uh, because a lot of debate on corporate tax reform is plagued by all kinds of problems. The, the many debates are, are not very precise. There's a lot of mistakes made, um, and it's very unstructured. People do not talk on, on, the, on the same terms usually. And I think a model like this really contributes to structuring the debate, and that is a, a key value of, of using a model like this. It provides a consistent and comprehensive framework and all the claims made are verifiable. We, we can put them back on the assumptions made uh, and how they transfer towards the conclusion so we can discuss the assumptions of the model. I think it is a key value added. And also a model like this, a simulation model, combines theory, which implies that we can really understand the intuition why particular effects occur, uh, with empirical information on the key elasticities, the, on the basis of the best available knowledge, and the institutions. So this is the, the three ingredients that you really need for, for good policy analysis. And of course, there's a lot of criticism possible, and actually George did a great job in criticizing his own model on the last page. Um, but I guess the, the, the value added is really that there, it provides a ground for this debate. Um, and actually, numbers generated by a model like this should be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, it's really the story that the model tells and not the numbers that it generates that, that is the value added, the key value added of, of the model. 
Um, so let me say a few words on, uh, on the model, some qualifications and questions. Um, and these are based on the information that I was given. I, I've not uh, seen all the details of the model and all the elasticities or reduced form elasticities to, to compare it with empirical literature. So my comments are based on, on what I've seen. Um, and I have a few concerns. First, um, I wasn't sure why there was quite an elaborate description of the housing sector. Uh, if you develop a model, you always have to make choices on what to include and what to exclude. Uh, and I wasn't sure whether modeling the housing sector was a first priority if you look at a model that is designed to analyze changes in the corporate tax rate. Uh, and even the OLG framework might have to do with the savings behavior, but I wasn't sure that it would, would be my first priority uh, for a model for corporate tax changes. But so uh, that's the first question mark, so to say. Then the, the, the basic framework. The basic framework, as I understand, is sort of a neoclassical basis with marginal decision making. So inframarginal decisions are not so important there. Uh, whereas from empirical literature we know, and the paper uh, describes that, is that the inframarginal decisions are actually quite important. Uh, so I like actually the extensions of the model very much, because that gives uh, a, a better flavor of, of all these inframarginal effects. But the choice of modeling here is, um, uh, there's some qualifications that can be made. For instance, um, there's not really a, a choice of the multinational choosing a location, uh, which can be quite important as the empirical literature reveals. Now modeling this is quite uh, difficult as we know, but the, the literature is progressing in this direction. The new economic geography literature describes the location of multinationals in a model with increasing returns and uh, transportation costs. And in these models you see that there is a possibility of, an, of a, uh, an agglomeration equilibrium in which firms um, uh, lumped together earn location-specific rents, and in this location uh, you can tax the returns without having firms leaving the, uh, the agglomeration. And this is applied to Europe, and it explains pretty well that you can sustain high tax rates in the core of Europe but have very low tax rate in the peripheral countries. And this is exactly what we see. So the, the, the models explain why countries differ very much with respect to tax rates. Now for the US, you can imagine that, that agglomeration rents are very important, uh, implying that you can sustain a, a fairly high rate. But of course, there's also these mobile rents, which uh, may matter. And you would like to have such mechanisms in your model if you want to analyze corporate tax rate changes. On the arbitrage, um, this is added to the model in a sort of ad hoc way, but it would be interesting to have it more uh, in the structure of the model itself, because it can be interactions between investment behavior and profit shifting behavior. The fact that you can shift your profits can relax the distortion for firms uh, of the corporate income tax on firm investment, because it doesn't matter so much for if you invest in the US if you can shift the profits afterwards anyway. Uh, so it relaxes the distortions in, 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 in investment maybe. So yeah, a, a more structural approach to these aspects, I guess, would be very helpful. The third point is credit constraint firms. Uh, what we see is that cash flows do influence investments, which can be explained by credit constraints. Uh, especially innovative or new firms may be credit constraints, and the um, internal funds in the firm can then have an impact on investments. So if you reduce the corporate tax rate, you increase the uh, internal flows in the, fu in the firm, and stimulate investment. And these investments can actually be very attractive because if these are innovative new firms, this can also generate more growth. So this is another argument actually for rate reduction. Um, then the debt bias. The debt equity ratio on the model is fixed. We know that the impact of the corporate income tax on financial structures is uh, relevant. So this adds another distortion to, uh, to the the, uh, to the, uh, an additional welfare cost of the corporate income tax. 
Uh, and this is especially relevant probably for the financial sector, where there's potentially huge externalities from excessive leverage due to systemic risk and, and, um, and moral hazards. Um, but there is also more targeted ways of addressing this debt bias. Rather, instead of reducing the corporate tax rate, you can uh, restrict interest deductions, or you can go the other way, uh, introducing an allowance for corporate equity, which tackles more directly the issue of debt bias. Um, another issue is the distribution. In fact, you, you raised the issue, I guess, um, underlying these simulations is, of course, a lot of distributional implications, which matter a lot for the uh, political debate. So if we discuss rate reduction and uh, cutting social transfers, of course, there's, a lot, there's some sort of equity efficiency trade-off underlying that, which is now not made explicit. Uh, and with respect to distribution, also the incidence issue, of course, is very important. Uh, so it would be good to have more information from the model results uh, about how this is treated in the model. How, how is the um, uh, incidence uh, distributed across people? I, well, the, the last point is, of course, obvious on, on parameter uncertainty. Let me skip this one because it was discussed quite extensively. The lump sum treatment of all these tax expenditures is, uh, in my view, also quite silly. And I like the, uh, the other approach. Um, and let me move to uh, this slide. Um, so having done this exercise with the model, um, we see that, uh, let me see. Um, so the first part then concludes base broadening rate reduction is very attractive, but the second part uh, puts some doubt on this conclusion. And I think this is actually a very important conclusion, uh, because many policymakers do not understand that base narrowing measures can actually be quite attractive. And in the corporate income tax, I bet that in this model, an allowance for corporate equity will perform very well. This will... I've, I've made a similar model for the European Union where we have allowance for corporate equity or a cash flow tax, and these are optimal policies, right? Especially in the neoclassical version of the model. In, in, in my European version of the model, when we add location choice, endogenous location choice by multinationals and the tax arbitrage, so the profit shifting, um, then the results may actually turn around then rate reduction may actually be more attractive for some countries. And that depends on whether multinationals are very important in the country and whether it's a large or a small country. So we find that for some small countries, actually, rate reduction is preferred over an allowance for corporate equity uh, under specific circumstances. I think um, this is, uh, puts the neoclassical model results into uh, some perspective. And I guess... This could also be interesting for in the U.S. context. What in the U.S. context uh, would be needed to make corporate tax rate reduction more attractive compared to these, uh, so to say, optimal income uh, corporate income tax systems? Credit constraints could be added. Um, be brief on that. On international comparisons, um, a lot of people motivate corporate tax rate reduction by international comparison. They point at the declining rates, statutory rates, but also effective tax rates internationally. But if you look a bit more carefully, I have here a picture showing the trends during the last 10 years in four regions in the world. So this is the European Union. This is 10 other European countries, or 11. So it's primarily further east in Europe. Uh, this is... 14, 14 countries in Asia, and this is 12 countries in the Americas. You see that the rate reduction is really a European phenomenon. An integrated market without any tax harmonization leads to regional tax competition. So it's not so much a... I mean, also, if you look at the OECD, this is dominated by all these European countries. Um, so I think the, the U.S. is big enough to make its own decision and not reflect too much on the European trends. And the European trends actually reflect uh, tax competition leading to too low a tax rate, which is, uh, leads to under-provision of public goods, as we know from the zodrov miskovsky model, right? Um, 
One, one uh, small last point. Um, oh, a black box again. Well, anyway, I'll, I'll do it without. Um, another argument against corporate tax rate reduction is that if there's location-specific rents earned and these are owned by foreigners, um, it is actually uh, a windfall gain to foreign taxpayers. And there's nothing more attractive than having foreigners pay for the U.S. deficit, right? Um, a final point, I guess it's very important to broaden the debate on tax reform. So I like very much the last two uh, um, uh, reforms where you shift towards the labor income tax, but I guess also the, the VAT would be a very interesting extension in, in this context. Or maybe a carbon tax, because carbon we should not subsidize, but we should tax carbon. Um, but otherwise, thanks a lot. Thank you, Rick. Uh, and our final discussant of the whole show uh, is Dr. Alan Viard from the American Enterprise Institute. And don't be surprised when you have one minute left. <laughs> well, it is always a uh, dubious distinction to be the final person uh, speaking at a uh, conference like this. But uh, thank you, uh, John and George, both for inviting me to the conference and specifically inviting uh, me to discuss your paper, which I found very interesting and very insightful. I think this is a key issue, rate reduction versus investment incentives, that needs uh, to get uh, a lot more attention than it has, uh, serious uh, analytical attention, and, and your paper takes a big step in that uh, direction. So I'm going to have to uh, go briefly because there's many uh, issues here to discuss. I'm going to go through a number of different points, kind of stating what I think the key issues are and briefly alluding you know, to maybe how the paper treated them, then circle back to kind of give an assessment of the, uh, the strengths of the paper and the uh, directions in which it can be extended, some of which uh, George actually has already uh, mentioned. So some of the issues that come up when we think about the choice between rate reduction and investment incentives are the impact on whether the playing field is level, uh, between across different industries and assets um, within the corporate sector. Another issue, of course, is debt equity. Another is corporate, non-corporate. Another is the treatment of old and new capital, which obviously is uh, is critical, and the above normal returns uh, treatment, which I think is also uh, quite important. Now, the level playing field, I think, can actually be set aside, which, of course, is what the paper ends up actually doing. Um, and the reason is because that simply making investment incentives bigger or smaller in the aggregate does not necessarily make the allocation of capital either more or less efficient. So, for example, the fact that depreciation schedules are slower uh, in general you know, does not mean that they are more correctly or less correctly aligned with the differences, the variations in, in the useful lives of various assets. And this is a point that I made um, to some extent in the National Tax Journal in September 2009. Um, and, and so one another way to state it is that you can level the playing field sometimes by broadening the base and sometimes by narrowing it. I think because we start with such a crazy quilt of corporate tax provisions, there's ample opportunity to do that in, in either uh, direction. I think it's less true for individual taxation where uh, making the playing field more level across different activities is generally going to involve base broadening, although even there it may in some cases uh, be narrowing. But in the corporate side, I really think we can almost view these as separable issues, how level the playing field is versus whether, uh, you know, whether investment incentives are neutral across different industries versus their overall uh, generosity. So the debt equity distortion, in contrast, is a, a critical issue, and unfortunately one that the paper in its current version, the model in its current version, doesn't address. Obviously, the corporate rate cut you know, directly reduces that distortion. Investment incentives that apply to both equity and debt financed investment don't, don't do that. You know, unless the firms, unless the investment incentives are especially generous, the firms become non-taxable, in which case uh, you actually do kind of back into a neutral treatment of debt and equity in a, in a somewhat awkward uh, manner. The corporate, non-corporate distortion, also critical here, and obviously this is in the paper. The corporate rate cut you know, does uh, directly reduce that distortion, while investment incentives do not, given that they have to apply to, to pass-through firms. It would be silly and unprecedented, of course, to have different uh, cost recovery allowances or, or something across the sectors, and, and so I think that option is rightly disregarded. Uh, this efficiency gain, of course, is the biggest political disadvantage of a corporate rate cut that is financed through a base broadening, uh, you know, telling people that we have uh, too few of our 
uh, resources uh, in the uh, C Corp sector and, and too many in the uh, pass-through sector is not uh, the political wisdom of the day. And, and so you know, far from being cited as an efficiency gain, uh, this usually is viewed as the biggest political drawback or obstacle uh, to uh, revenue neutral corporate tax uh, rate cut and base broadening. So the old and new capital, I think uh, we sort of know the uh, the logic here. The windfall gain to, to old capital, of course, provides no uh, direct incentive effect, while obviously the investment incentives for new investment do. There's also an intergenerational uh, redistribution uh, uh, towards the uh, the current elderly in an OLG model like this. And so the income substitution effects of giving a, a break to old capital instead of giving it to new capital uh, both tend to reduce saving. There is then a significant reduction in, in the long run the gain to, to future generations, part of which is uh, an efficient, you know, there's an efficiency effect, and part of which is just a pure redistribution between current and future generations. Jane and others have papers that kind of sort those out. One issue, just to throw out in passing, you know, in principle, at least one could, if one decided that a rate cut was otherwise better than investment incentives, one could try to recapture this windfall gain in some fashion. There was, of course, a modest and, and proposal in, in 85 uh, windfall recapture by Treasury that uh, vanished almost immediately um, upon being presented. Uh, but uh, it's uh, you know this, this idea that may have some uh, merit to it. Uh, the above normal returns are an important uh, issue. I think they need to be examined more. I've, I've not really dealt with them much in my own writing and thinking I think this is important. They do, of course, get a larger benefit from rate cut than from investment incentives. In a very simple model, we're not concerned about relocation across sectors or countries, of course, we really do want to tax these things. It's a lump sum tax uh, and, and one that falls on uh, those who are largely well-to-do. But of course, the concern is precisely that it may prompt these returns to relocate across countries or sectors. Um, you know, in, in principle, we can avoid that with a destination-based tax. We can even avoid it under an origin-based tax if we do the transfer pricing and, and really the, and the sourcing correctly. In other words, if we, we have the right royalties and then we source the royalties correctly, uh, but we don't really source royalties correctly and, and furthermore uh, transfer pricing is you know uh, to, to say that we can can handle above normal returns correctly if we have the transfer pricing right you know is, is to state the impossible because the situation which transfer pricing breaks down is exactly when we have this uh, situation so the uh, the paper is right to examine that so then the paper turns to looking at other financing options besides just doing the revenue neutral uh, you know, base broadening uh, they do find the wage tax and spending cuts of course are better on efficiency grounds we know the distributional effects have to be considered uh, the distinction between production and lump sum provisions and investment incentives is is certainly uh, important and obviously um, changing the one is more um, beneficial than the other. There are some other financing options that could be considered. The consumption tax, of course, it would not be much different than the wage tax, but I think a, a bit more attractive for familiar reasons. And furthermore, it's the, the option that's often proposed. I mean, we, you know, by Congressman Ryan at, at one point and so on to, to put in a VAT uh, to replace the corporate income tax. So it might in some sense be better to look at that instead of the wage tax, but wouldn't make much difference. Another option, of course, is which came up in the last session, is to increase the individual taxation of, of corporate income. Some of the distinctive distortions of the uh, corporate income tax would be avoided if we tax at the uh, individual level instead through increased taxation of dividends and capital gains as a replacement uh, for uh, taxing at the corporate level. There are issues that would have to be addressed. I mean, in the long run, that approach might well require accrual taxation for publicly traded uh, stock. Another option that also came up last time is a tighten the corporate interest deduction. I think that's a rather appealing way to proceed. Uh, obviously, you'd have to model the de debt equity choice to uh, to bring that into this paper. So what are the strengths of this paper? Well, actually, many. Uh, first of all, the, the OLG framework and, and the model in general, I think, is very rigorous. I like it. I've, of course, uh, commented on this model before, and, and so I would um, just echo my earlier comments. I, I like this as a way of thinking about uh, these kinds of issues. It does model the old and new capital, uh, the above normal returns, and the corporate non-corporate distortion. It sets aside this issue about the level playing field, and the authors actually, you know, apologize for this. They say, oh, you, know, we, we, you know, we're probably leaving out some gains here and, you know, it's kind of hard to do and so we're not doing it. Well, it is hard to do and, of course, in, ideally, you know, you'd like a really disaggregated model where you can actually look at, at how specific um, changes to investment incentives would affect uh, the, the tilt or of the playing field. Uh, but again, I think it's actually separable from the main question this paper is examining. The, the core question of how generous do we want these investment incentives to be in the aggregate, you know, and, and how do we trade that off against the rates, really is separate from how particular changes to those investment incentives affect the allocation across different industries. So I think that there actually is no gain that is being omitted here from generically um, 
curtailing investment incentives and uh, lowering rates. And so I think it's actually perfectly appropriate uh, to set that aside um, in this context. Um, the distinction between investment production and lump sum provisions is certainly uh, you know, absolutely critical. The Treasury treatment in the 2007 study actually makes, clearly makes no sense. I think we have a, a consensus on that, and I would echo that. If anything, I think the paper should be, uh, should be more emphatic on that and, and really should make clear that the illustrative estimates you do where you adopt the Treasury uh, approach you know, are really just intended you know, to, to show how much of a difference it makes and to kind of reconcile your results with theirs and, and to make clear that we're not considering you know, that approach. I mean, if anything, these industry-specific provisions you know, almost certainly have more of an impact, you know, clearly have at least as much of an impact on investment because the, the, the firms in those industries know about those provisions and think about them and lobbied for them, and, and almost certainly their behavior behavior you know, is affected by them. So what can be done uh, just finally to, to extend and improve this, uh, this model? I think the debt equity choice really does need to be, uh, to be modeled, in, you know, even if it's done in an ad hoc way. I mean, obviously, many of the things in the model are ad hoc. They have to be ad hoc. Over time, they'll become more refined. But I think it, it's time, given the other things in the model, to put the debt equity choice in there. That will strengthen the case for, for rate reduction, for whatever that's worth. I said improve the modeling above normal returns. And maybe that just means, to some extent, clarify and generalize might be a better way to put it. Uh, the paper in its current version has a verbal description in the uh, appendix and no equations uh, on exactly how this is, is handled. I would put a verbal description in the text and then the full equations in the appendix to just get a better understanding of exactly what's going on. I think this question, you know, as George said, is the, 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 of how to model the mobility across the, the sector with the above normal returns, the international mobility, I think that's critical. I think that clearly can be improved. I think, as, as, as you said, George, I think there's also um, alternative models that, to do as well here, maybe to present one or two others and just see how the results uh, uh, generalize. I, I did want to clarify the production incentives. Like I say, it's important to distinguish those. I'm assuming the production incentives enter pretty much the same way as the rate reduction incentives in the cost of Again, I think having the equations would be helpful, but and that seems like the right treatment that in both of these cases you're uh, simply lowering uh, the effective rate of tax applied to capital income. There's other provisions that would be completely different that are effectively taxes on labor, while well, Jane mentioned as, as like conduit provisions. So um, and I, I think, as we mentioned, uh, there's also these additional financing options to consider in terms of interest deductibility and increased taxation of, of corporate income at the individual level. So it is time, and I am done. Thank you. have George come up and we have four minutes he will uh, comment and close the conference. Okay. Um, I want to thank uh, both of the discussants uh, for a, a very careful reading and a lot of a lot of great ideas. Uh, so uh, we're be busy uh, busy at work implementing those and in fact I, there's not too much that that I, I, I disagree with as far as the, the the comments that were made. As far as uh, you know why have housing in the model uh, it, it's primarily, I mean, we, we, we don't have the level playing field uh, analysis within uh, the corporate sector, but we do capture uh, differences across uh, the corporate sector and the non-corporate uh, and housing relative to uh, non-housing investment. And given the, the housing, half the capital stock, I mean, we think, and, and, and it's not going to be affected directly by this provision. We think it's important to uh, in, in include that. Uh, as well, and, and plus, it's you know it's important for a lot of the other reforms that we use uh, to analyze uh, in the model. Uh, and, and in addition, uh, it's important uh, when we're looking at the transition effects because uh, we're able to look at, uh, for example, the effects of various reforms on uh, housing prices when uh, you know the change, there's a change in the mortgage interest deduction or whatever. We can capture simultaneously effects on equity prices uh, and housing prices, uh, which uh, in, in many contexts uh, is, is is quite useful. Uh, I really like the idea of the, you know, the, um, the more uh, complicated or more uh, uh, integrated notion of uh, modeling the multinational firm and, and, and location decisions. I'm familiar with the paper that you were talking about, uh, and that's one, of the, that's one of them that we've been looking at in terms of thinking about how to uh, extend the model. Um, 
On the cash flow side, I'm not, I'm not quite so sure. I mean, at the last conference, we had a, a, a paper by uh, Hassett and Newmark, uh, which argued uh, fairly convincingly, I think, that the, the cash flow uh, arguments were less empirically supported than people thought uh, a long time ago. I mean, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll put it that way. Um, and uh, as far as determining incidents, I mean, in, in this model, all we can do is intergenerational incidents, uh, but uh, in a, you know, in a more complicated version, we could have uh, individuals, you know, separate individuals within each uh, a generation. Uh, I also very much like the idea of looking at an, uh, an ace uh, within this uh, context. We'd have to have a, uh, an endogenous debt equity decision, uh, but that's really not that hard, hard to do. And we've got a great paper to, uh, which, which, which surveys, uh, I don't know how many, <laughs> uh, analyses of the, the responsiveness of debt and equity to differences in taxes. So we'll have plenty of parameter choices uh, uh, to, to, to choose from. Um, uh, I also uh, I, I am not, so, not, not quite so instinctively opposed to this notion of a windfall recapture tax, or at least uh, looking at that, uh, Alan. So I, I, I agree with you that it's, it's something uh, worth thinking about, especially within the context. Uh, if you have a, a very accelerated depreciation allowances, if you, if you had bonus depreciation uh, for a long period of time, uh, and then you have a big rate drop. Uh, so it, it's at least uh, uh, at least worth thinking about. Um, there certainly are lots of additional options that we could uh, we could think about, uh, and uh, over time we'll we'll try to. Um, any other authors want to say? Okay. So should I close her down, or you want to? Okay. Uh, well, in that case. Uh, I'd like to also uh, her, her lots of thanks to John and George, uh, so we'd like to return the favor. Uh, we are uh, certainly uh, just delighted that you were able to, to, to come to the conference, uh, especially to all the participants. Uh, we think it's been just a, a, a marvelous, very thought-provoking and stimulating conference, and we hope to all see you back uh, here at Rice uh, very soon. Thanks very much.